Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andrea Creamer, and I'm the PCN uh, Community Engagement Coordinator. Uh, welcome to the first session of Peer Talks, Life Stories, The Human Side of Addiction. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the burnabycoronavirus.com website. That's www.burnabycoronavirus.com website. Burnaby Primary Cares respectfully acknowledges that the work we do as individuals and as an organization takes place on the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Halkameum and the Skohoma speaking people. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this sacred and shared ter territory together. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask a question. So this afternoon, we are joined by Dilpreet Tierra, coordinator of the Burnaby Community Action Team, as well as two peers, Heidi and Carl. Thank you for joining us today. Dilpreet? Hi, thank you, Andrea. Yes, um, I'm Dilpreet. I'm the um, Burnaby um, Community Action Team coordinator for um, we're through Burnaby Family Life. Um, we've been established since 2018 um, due to the overdoses um, is why we created an action table. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, what we do as we um, get together with um, our peers, engage them to um, create services in the city of Burnaby and working with other community partners. Um, today I have peer, uh, I have um, our peers, Carl and Hetty who will be speaking, um, who are a part of our CPR group um, and that are helping to um, delete stigma in the city of Burnaby. Katie, go ahead. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. I appreciate your attendance. Um, I, uh, you know, one of my um, personal goals um, as an addict or an addict uh, that is no longer um, active. I um, really uh, want to let people know what it's like. Um, for I know um, that, you know, it's really hard for others to wrap their head around something they haven't truly experienced themselves. So um, <clears throat> at this point in time, uh, today, my life, uh, my life is good. Uh, I am clean and sober. I am um, working for the Burnaby Family Life or through Burnaby Family Life for this, uh, you know, this CAP project. I am a um, co-coordinator for the peers group, which is um, a combination of uh, beautiful people that have uh, um, experienced um, drug addiction, lived experience, or still living. Um, yeah, and I'm grateful to be on that, in that group and with all my peeps. Um, so, you know, today life is good. Um, I am <clears throat> right now, <clears throat> excuse me, um, about um, uh, coming on to three months. Uh, I have my own place, um, you know, kind of like I get uh, uh, reintegrating myself into a regular, if you will, um, lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle is um what i've been doing right now right um i've um i am involved in a bunch of things like um being advocates for people who are still addicted or, and um, working with other women mostly women um you know that are, are that found a new way to live right and uh we need to encourage each other to keep going because um <clears throat> changing everything about yourself if you will mainly uh your thought process is it's a lot of hard work mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of nurturing and supports uh needed in order for that to we you know to maintain that so life has not always looked like this um i was born in holland i um at the age of two, my family moved to Suriname, which is a Dutch Guyana. And I basically grew up there till the age of nine. And um, so I went from the tropics to uh, eventually living in Fort McMurray within a, a, you know, between the ages of nine and 10. So uh, must have been traumatic because I do not remember my first snowfall <laughs> from uh, the tropics to uh, winterland. Um, <clears throat> so when, when, my family and I moved to um, Canada. Uh, we moved all over the place. So from the age of um, nine, 
uh, nine and a half, uh, all the way to the age of 14. Um, you know, I, I was moving schools all the time. Um, I, I didn't have the experience uh, building relationships. Um, <clears throat> that was a little bit of a downfall. But one thing I did experience is um, being able to be uh, flexible with moving um, um, and accepting people in, in different towns. Uh, there's different ways of living. And um, <clears throat> I'm really, I feel blessed that I had that experience because um, it's made me very open-minded and adaptable. So <clears throat> when I was about 13, um, it was about 13 when I moved to Vancouver, like I've been in Sparwood, I've been in Fernie, Fort McMurray, um, and then finally Surrey, BC. So I, I started my grade eight there and um, <clears throat> I discovered uh, drugs and alcohol uh, and I, I thought it was a really cool thing, you know, being young like that. Um, I didn't realize um, the path that it was going to lead me on. And um, eventually, you know, um, it, it progressed um, <clears throat> throughout the years. I'm 52 today. Um, so I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> there's so much, so much substance that I could share with you, but um, I'm going to leave most of that up to you. If you have any questions, please, uh, please feel free to ask me anything. Um, so, about uh, two and a half years ago, I, I entered a um, safe place, a treatment, and uh, <clears throat> my journey to uh, fully recover started there. But before I got there, uh, my life was really uh, turned upside down. Oh, it's <clears throat> so before I got there, um, as to the progression of my um, addiction, I experienced um, some deaths that I've never been through. So, uh, you know, before I came in um, with the crisis uh, that we're dealing with right now, I got um, introduced to that because I was somewhat substance clean or uh, free since 2010. Uh, I changed my lifestyle of 24-7 addict to uh, trying to make it, right, to live a healthy lifestyle, but I didn't let go. I was an abstinent um, so I thought, oh yeah, changing my lifestyle, that would be good, right? I'd be around different people. And I had part of that right. Um, I remember uh, dealing with the crisis that's out there right now, the fentanyl. Um, it, uh, I OD'd on that many a times. And I was very unfamiliar uh, through my past with this kind of uh, drug out there. And uh, there was a lot of people around us um, ODing. Some, of, some people not making it, actually a lot of people not making it. Um, and I remember, you know, my very first time I went to a hospital, um, you know, they brought me back, they cared for me um, and got a bus ticket to go, go home and carry on with my life. Um, and then there was one experience, uh, it was a really good experience where people actually followed through and, um, um, they're really trying to help me. Um, and it's not something that I've experienced as an addict. Um, right? You're just, um, we're just a waste of space. Um, look at her. She's a mess. Why could she, Why would she do that? And, and, and you know, people and their judgments, right? And, and, and most of it comes from not, not quite understanding what it's all about. And uh, the despair we go through and why we keep doing the same thing. It's um, perplexing, right? Uh, is it perplexing to myself also? So um, this person, he was a uh, counselor through um, like a Fraser Health, mental health and uh, addictions. And um, he really cared for me. He was patient with me. Um, I remember when I went to uh, see him, you know, after I OD'd and got out of the hospital, um, because at that time I really did need help and I wanted help and I put effort into that. So uh, I, um, I came to him 
he was there to help me fill in some paperwork, you know, do what I needed to do in order to get into a treatment facility. And um, I was so, um, I was so out of it, um, you know, messed up pretty bad. Um, and um, I would, I would pass out on him uh, due to uh, the drugs I was taking and also just being mentally exhausted, physically exhausted from staying up for days. And um, he would wait, he would wait patiently and kindly and I'd come to and then he'd continue and we'd make phone calls and um, I would even, I'd fall asleep or, and then he would wait patiently again. And all those things, I, I, it all followed through and I ended up at the wonderful house that I did two and a half years ago. And you know, um, talking about that, um, you know, like being worthless in the eyes of many people that don't understand. Um, I had a terrible experience, one of many um, at the hospital through that time. I'm just sharing with you that uh, small period of time that I experienced before I went to treatment. Um, and I, re I had a terrible infection, a terrible infection. And, um, you know, I was at the point of sheer desperation and, um, it was a dark place where I didn't even care about myself. Um, I ended up having an infection on my foot and it got worse and worse as time passed. Um, you know, within a matter of a couple of weeks, um, people kept telling me, you got to go to the hospital because now the infection is all the way up to my knee. And um, I didn't want to go. Right. I didn't care. Um, I lost I lost my will. So uh, anyhow, I didn't end up going to emergency and they put me on um, intravenous daily um, antibiotic treatment. I remember the first time I walked in and um, I like to think of myself as a polite person. <laughs> so, I, you know, being polite, friendly, hello, how are you? Da, 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 this is what's happening. And um, this woman wouldn't look me in the eye. She, she was being abrasive and... Um, well, you know, I, I would just chalk it up to, well, she's a busy girl, right? She's very busy. She's working hard. Who knows how long she's been working right now. So I would, I would just um, push it aside and carry on with what I needed to do. And um, there was a point in my stay there through that treatment. Um, she, um, you know, she's ignored many of my questions too. I was curious and she would ignore me because she's busy and it's okay. She's busy, right? And I, then I noticed how kind and compassionate she was with the other patients. And um, and, and then I too, again, like, it's okay. You know, you're a drug addict, look at you. That's what, what do you expect, Haiti? But, um, you know, and that's something that I've developed over time too, right? To ignore it and normalize um a lot of uh, the treatment that I would get, um, right, naturally. Mm. But um, yeah, that really, um, really affected me. Um, I would uh, be in the bathroom, I'd be sobbing and trying to pull myself together because I knew um, how bad I looked and I knew what a mess I was. Um, and, um, but you know, a little bit of kindness and um, just to be seen and heard would have made a big difference. So, um, you know, through all that, um, again, it's something that's normal, it was normal for me, right? Um, but, um, you know, my family upbringing was good. I had a good family upbringing and there was no drugs or alcohol. Um, my dad um, and my mom treated me well. They provided well for us. And um, but I, I, it's, I, I was interested in um, that other lifestyle, like starting at um, high school with um, the naughty people, if you will, right? Um, and I, it perplexed my parents, and and then I was off on my own, um, my own adventure um, by the age of fifteen. And then that brought me back, bringing you back to uh, what I just shared at the hospitals with you. Um, so I was, I stayed in the treatment facility for two years. They have like uh, your treatment facility. Um, it's like a 
uh, most facilities are three month program. So I stayed there for the three months. I did uh, what was required, but I stayed in that house for another four months, altogether seven months before I went to second stage or there was a room at second stage. And um, I really needed to do that because I needed to be in a, a, a safe place to reprogram. I needed to be in a safe place to, um, to heal, if you will. And we did a lot of work there, uh, a lot of spiritual work, right? Like a lot of trauma-based work. Um, and I didn't realize, um, I didn't truly really realize what trauma was um, in your face, violence, in your face, abuse. You can see it. It's very there. Um, it's been most of my experience. Um, but I didn't realize the subtle ways uh, that were uh, abusive to myself. Um, but today um, I get that. And, um, you know, I'm working to heal myself and that's where it starts. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Haiti. Yeah. Thank My you. pleasure. Carl. Yeah. Hey everyone. I'm Carl and I'm one of the peers in our little group, um, working with Burnaby family life and the uh, Burnaby cat team. And um, just a, a little bit about myself, I, I was working at uh, the shelters and detox and stuff downtown for about 15 years. And um, just about when the uh, fentanyl crisis was starting, I went off of work. That was about five years ago. But right around the time I was um, working right down by uh, Oppenheimer Park, and uh, it was quite uh, quite sad to see all the people that were dying because of uh, this uh, fentanyl crisis. And uh, yeah, um, I've uh, I've been clean and sober now for almost twenty seven years, so. I'm quite a long time removed from active addiction, but I still remember quite vividly um, the addiction and the time I spent out on the street and running around and stuff. Uh, let's see, my my drinking um, started very early. I, I grew up in a family with a, a violent alcoholic father, and so he would come home drunk and hit my mom and it was quite dramatic and us kids would all go running and hiding because we didn't want to get in the middle of it and uh, my dad um, he used to give me the little bit in the bottom of his beer and I don't really remember how old I was I think I was about two or two and a half because the beer bottle was like this big <laughs> so that's how I explain how old I was I don't know exactly what my age was but I guess around two or two and a half and that went on for a little while until my uh, mom found out and what happened was uh, my dad whenever he would drink back in those days the beer bottle would make a popping sound when you'd open it so every time the he would open a beer i would come running because i knew that sound and my mom saw that and so she cut me off she's like you can't do this your son's going to become an alcoholic and blah 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 so the next day i was about five years old and uh, they had had a party at the house and I got up early in the morning and I started drinking all the little there was half drinks and stuff sitting there that they didn't finish and I was drinking all this stuff and um, I ended up being drunk and lying on the couch at five years old and my mom came out of the bedroom and she started to yell at me about you know what I've done and all this stuff and I thought that I don't care. I don't care what you're saying. I don't care what's happening. Um, I just don't care. And I think that was the 
beginning of the end, as they say. And so from there, uh, my parents split up because uh, my mom was scared that my dad was going to end up killing her. So uh, she took us kids and we left and uh, moved in with my grandparents. And I was about six. It was just before I turned seven. So right around that time. And then within about a year, uh, my mom remarried. So I grew up with a stepdad. So it was kind of a different um, um, childhood. Uh, it was quite a lot of trauma. And from there, we moved around a bit. And finally, we settled in this uh, little town just about 60 miles outside of Toronto. And, um, you know, I, I did everything I could to get alcohol and drugs and I started doing drugs by the time I was 10 and then uh, by the time I was 12 I thought well I might as well start selling drugs so then I can have drugs for free and that kept going and um, my uh, adulthood and adolescence and stuff I quit school uh, I didn't finish high school. Um, I uh, ended up just selling drugs and not working or, or anything. And it was uh, quite a, a different lifestyle. Uh, being addicted, you don't really care about anything. The only thing that you really care about is getting more and keeping going. And so I was in Ontario and I... Um, knew that Expo was coming to Vancouver. So me and some friends decided to come out to Vancouver. So I came out to Vancouver in 86 for Expo, um, stayed for about a year, um, was arrested a few times <laughs> and decided to um, go back to Ontario and not go to jail. <laughs> so I took off and went back to Ontario for a few years and uh, got into trouble there as well. It's, it's not um, that I wanted to get into trouble. It's just I had to do what I had to do to get drugs. So I would just get drugs, sell them, make enough so then I could get high. And uh, that went on for a number of years and then I came back to Vancouver in 1990. Um, I was living on the downtown east side and all the different hotels and, and uh, rooming places and stuff down there. It got pretty bad near the end for me. Um, I, I tell this story to my friends all the time. Uh, I, it's not that I didn't want to rent a room. I couldn't rent a room anymore because all the people that were running the hotels and stuff down there knew me. And so they wouldn't rent to me anymore. And I had a, a, what was called a, a rent voucher from welfare, um, intent to rent, I think they used to call it. And I took it to a bunch of different hotels down there and everyone said no <laughs> it was quite a sad state of affairs to be in when you don't want to be homeless but you're made to be homeless because no one wants to rent to you so uh yeah that was about six months or so i was totally homeless didn't have any place to stay and i started going in and out of detox um I was, and I didn't even, I didn't want to go to detox to stop using. I just went to detox to rest. So I went to detox for two or three days and I'd eat and sleep and eat and sleep and, and then I'd leave. And every time I'd go to detox, uh, the people there, this was at Cordova Detox, the people there would ask me if I wanted to go to treatment and I'd just say no nope, just wake me up when the next meal is and I'd eat sleep eat sleep and and leave again 
And uh, that went on for a number of times. And then one time I actually did go to treatment and I went out to this place called Miracle Valley and it was out in, um, uh, I don't know, a Maple Ridge or something. It was way, way out somewhere. And I didn't even know where I was. And I ended up getting kicked out of there because um, I threatened this guy because he stole my cigarette butts because I didn't have cigarettes to smoke. So uh, anyways, I ended up back in Vancouver. Uh, and then um, I ended up trying to go back to treatment again so I decided to do it one more time and I went to this place out on the Sunshine Coast in this little place called Port Mellon and so what I would do there is I would just go and hike up the mountain every day and you know um, I did pretty good I uh, I stayed there for about three months and and then I'm not really sure what happened, but something happened and the police were called and I had a warrant for something I had done in Kamloops or something. And so the police grabbed me and uh, took me to Gibson's and then they flew me back to uh, Vancouver. And then from there, I, I ended up uh, um, back downtown again and in and out of detox again and then uh i ended up uh going i had to go to the hospital because i i had gotten endocarditis which is like a virus in my heart and uh, pneumonia at the same time so it was pretty bad i almost died uh, i had to stay in the hospital for a month on intravenous antibiotics and I got out of the hospital and I thought you know okay the doctor's telling me that if I keep doing what I'm doing I'm gonna die soon and yeah you know, I that idea kind of kept me straight for a couple of days but after that I just went right back at it so then I was uh, living in the rooms downtown in uh, Blood Alley, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had I went back into detox again and got out of detox again, and I was in a room downtown, and uh, I had enough money uh, so I could go get high. And uh, when I woke up in the morning, and I I thought to myself, I thought what do I want? Do I want to live? Do I want to die? Uh, what do I want out of life? And so I thought, you know, well, I want to live. So I ended up, I was smoking at the time, so I ended up going and buying a pouch of tobacco, uh, getting a SkyTrain ticket, and I got out of there. And my life has changed so much. Because I, I never finished high school, I went back to school. I decided to keep going after I got my grade 12. So I went to Kwantlen and I got a degree in psychology. And then I kept going and got another degree at SFU for uh, sociology, anthropology. And then I started working downtown at that uh, detox. So I, my first job downtown was with the uh, uh, Cordova Detox. And then I started working at one of the shelters downtown. And like I said, I worked downtown Vancouver for about 15 years. And uh, now, like I said, I've been off work for about five years. So I've been involved with this group. Um, our group is called CPR, Community Peers Resources. And we're peers that have experienced addiction and we're trying to make a difference in the uh, fentanyl crisis. So um, that's why I'm here trying to make a difference. And yeah, if anyone has any questions about 
you know, my experience or about what we're going to do and what we're doing here today, just feel free. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here in the chat. Um, it says, what made you, this could be for both of you, what made you turn your turn around and control your substance use? Go ahead, Hetty, if you want to go first. Um, what made me control my substance use? Um, first of all, uh, you ever hear that term being tired of being sick and tired? Um, I think for me, it has to do with getting uh, a repeated amount of time. Like I, I, I would uh, live loaded is their term of being active in our addiction. And then I'd have um, uh, moments or, or periods of abstinence and they added up within myself um, for me uh, to use that information um, on, on basically living well and taking care of self. Um, so that accumulated and where I finally realized I, I'm so tired of this lifestyle. I'm so tired of uh, being an addict and um, it's no fun. It never was fun, right? Wow. <clears throat> and so, yeah, that, cumul the cumu um, that uh, accumulation of information and, and how to take care of self and being well um, and that I am a person uh, that's worthy of many things, right? Uh, most of all, happiness um, that pushed me to some more information and more support. And I was able to do that. And I, I find that a lot of us as addicts, um, we don't really want to be in that space, right? Especially when it starts getting hard and you truly are addicted, um, you become to, uh, at a point where you're using without even really wanting to, right? Um, so yeah, I'm so grateful to be at this point in my time in my life, really, right? Yeah, for me, um, it, uh, really, it wasn't about controlling my addiction. It was about uh, stopping. Either I was going to stop or I was going to die. <laughs> so it was a pretty straightforward question to myself is do I want to live or do I want to die and so I had to make that decision like it was up to me if I wanted to keep using I could have kept using but it probably wouldn't have ended well and so I'm glad I decided life um, instead of the alternative um I have a question maybe either one of you could answer um how do you think we can better support um, drug users or um, people that use um, in our community? I think for Burnaby, the number one thing that could help out in Burnaby in, specifically is uh, opening detox spaces because Burnaby has zero detox beds. To get to detox, you have to go to Vancouver or you have to go to Surrey. And it's a big uh, rigmarole to get into Vancouver. You have to actually lie and tell them that you don't have any housing or you're homeless. You can't tell them that you live in Burnaby because they're only accepting people from the uh, Vancouver Coastal Health region. And so that, that health authority. So you have to go to Surrey, which takes somewhere in between three and seven days. And yeah. if the statistics are to be believed, between three and seven days, there's people dying every single day. So yeah, opening up detox spaces would be my answer to that. Yeah, I, I yeah I agree um, because that start that's the start of a process too. Um, because again, you know, we're, our, our brains are swimming in, um, chemicals, right? We can't think straight. Um, and we need, we need that period of time to, uh, be free of the chemicals, uh, floating in our system and, uh, you know, be present. And then we can start talking about how to keep that and abstinence, like uh, and personally, there's no controlling, by the way. Um, it has to be abstinence. Yeah. 
and start a healing process, right? Because I find a lot of people, a lot of us out there, um, you know, it's a trauma-based um, issue, um, depending on who you are, there's a variance of it. But, um, and, and, and I find that when we are continually using, um, a lot of uh, trauma comes through that period of time, right? A lot of stuff happens. A lot of stuff happens. And uh, we all as human beings need to get out of that. You know, and it could be look different um, for other people too, right? Um, we need a moment of having a breath of fresh air and being able to see a new perspective whatever your addiction or experience in life. What um, advice could you give to the youth these days? Mm. Stay in yeah. school. <laughs> Don't use. <laughs> um, you know what? I I, I think um, you know this has always been my train of thought um, since I can remember. Um, I wish somebody would have taught me about simple things like how thought works, the thought process, and um, you know how how truly beautiful we are as individuals as an individual, but one in the same, you know, things like that um, would be a wonderful thing to teach in school. Um, I was so, um, you know, unknowing. A lot of, of my drug use started with unknowingness and then the abuse and trauma and continued in that way, right? Young and dumb and vulnerable. And um, yeah, something, something needs to give. Um, maybe in schools there could be, um, you know, peer meetings, uh, just letting them know they need to know, right? I think uh, not knowing is a huge, um, knowing is a benefit, right? Knowing what it's really like, right? As a teenager, I thought it was cool. So I went out and I followed. What do you think that is missing in Burnaby to support the people who are using drugs? <sighs> Uh, I don't know if Sorry. there's a lot of harm harm reduction supplies out there. Like I um, am not aware of like a needle exchange or a place where people can get safe um, uh, stuff paraphernalia to use. Like the number one thing is harm reduction. Uh, the next step is maybe treatment or something. But the first thing is just to keep people alive. And so to keep people alive, uh, they need to have uh, safe stuff to use with until they want to make that decision that they want to change their lives. Until they want to make that decision, um, they need to be supported. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I'm wondering, uh, either one of you could answer, but... Uh... We had a question come in in advance that was that asks, is it helpful or harmful to offer unsolicited help to someone that's using substances? So for, for example, um, if a community service provider sees someone who is clearly under the influence and start, starts to talk to them, maybe offers them a card, offers them help, um, you know, and like see where the conversation goes, et cetera. But do you think that's harmful or is that helpful? Well, I think if you were offering them something like a sandwich <laughs> and your card, but not just your card, like something to kind of break the ice. Uh, when I was working downtown, uh, there was this one uh, woman that used to come in in a wheelchair and she used to be quite um, a handful. <laughs> and uh, and I used to have to deal with her all the time. So what I would do is I would have a muffin handy. And then when she would wheel on in all crazy like, I'd say, hope, hope, slow down, slow down, come on around here. And then before she gets going, I'd say, here, have a muffin. Now let's talk. And that kind of slow them down. And to, to they just, people just slow down. So maybe if it's like an outreach worker or someone that's trying to connect them with community services. If they had something to offer them like a, a granola bar or a, a sandwich or an apple or something, and then, and then have your card there too. So then they could take both. Yeah. And I think, uh, 
you know, uh, establishing a bit of a relationship from human being to human being, you know, looking them in the eye and and, and really listening. Um, And I found sometimes, uh, you know, people don't want to listen, clearly don't persist um, because they're not going to listen. They're not going to hear anything. Uh, But if you're around all the time, like you're working with them uh, on the streets, you're an advocate continue working with them and um really listen eye to eye heart to heart that really makes a difference being seen and heard and the muffin is good (laughs) (laughs) i guess uh similar to that uh maybe a bit like of a closer relationship like how could a friend uh or family member effectively support a person that's uh using um so that that person can regain, you know, their health and, and participate. Well, on. well, number one, just keep the lines of communication open. Because if you just say, you know, like, I'm not going to talk to you anymore until you do what I think you need to do, that's not helpful for anyone. But if you say to them, look, if you want help, if you need something, you call and we'll talk about it. Not that you should give a practicing addict anything that they want because that's not good either but be open to discuss things with them not so um tough love as to say no i don't want to hear from you have 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 dialogue yeah it's a tricky thing right because uh depending on the individual and a few of the details it is a fine dance (laughs) Um, but the pushing, pushing and enabling, I find it is not helpful. Um, it's either going to prolong the process or, um, it, it, pushing them is going to make them just go. But how would you do with a family member that's there supporting their family members who are you? I off all the time. Not for the whole, not for the whole I, of it. I, sorry. Well, my uh, my phone keeps ringing. I'm uh, I apologize, and then it cuts me off. <laughs> um, what would you tell a family member who's trying to be supportive but yet not trying to enable their family members who are using substances? Well, don't don't give them money. <laughs> don't no number, money ever. <laughs> number one, yeah, don't give them money if they want to come over and get some food or something like that. That's fine, because like food is help but money is more destructive Mm -hmm. and i've always um learned that if it's a family member there's lots of emotions attached to the relationship Mm -hmm. and so if i'm a recovering person and i have a family member that needs help it's got to be someone other than me so they can i can tell them where to go to get help but i can't do it myself because there's too much history absolutely Uh, yeah i would bring in um, or talk to somebody that uh has dealt with this you know a counselor or an advocate somebody that's familiar with this kind of um issue and um you know i i uh, one of my close friends um his girlfriend is dealing with his 22 year old her 22 year old son who is really struggling you know he's a bit lost and he is uh put himself into a uh, addiction and um what was helpful for him is um you know her boyfriend who's also struggled with addiction talking to him and uh like uh, establishing a connection open line of communication but very sturdy right like you'd call him on his his stuff and like smarten up um yeah uh you know like uh i'm i'm part of uh, an aana program and we have this thing called 12 steps where another individual with the same kind of experience would be able or, or can connect uh the best with an individual struggling with drugs or alcohol somebody to relate family is hard hey because it like you said it's too close hey and yeah never give them money do not give us money 
ever. Would you say that for the parents that are getting their children not to use drugs? Would you do this? Would you do the same thing for them? Yep. Yep. And then yep. Uh, question that came in, if there had been a safe drug supply from a medical staff, would you have used it? I would say yes. Of course. But, you know, for me as an addict, um, depending on, on how hard it is, you know, sometimes if I have to go walk there or get there in order to um, get the drugs, uh, <laughs> it might be a deterrent for me, right? Do I have bus fare? Do I got somebody to give me a ride there? Um, is there drugs in my environment right there? Um, I Like, I personally am insane when I'm, uh, in active addiction and um, for me I, I don't know. you have to commute across the city yeah. and do a bunch yeah, of right? things like well, you're gonna for me the whole the whole time I was out there I only saw a doctor um, yeah. twice in like mm -hmm. whatever 15 years or 20 years that I was using I went to see a doctor twice so to have that like if if that option had been available, if I went to say the needle exchange, Diaz, I think it used to be called, if I went to the needle exchange and I went there uh, and they told me, oh, hey, you can get a safe supply of uh, drugs here, I probably would have went there. But yeah. using doing it through a doctor's office or um, medical facility, I, I don't know. I, I personally, like I, I just tried to stay away from doctors because I didn't want to know what was going on with me because I would rather not learn that stuff mm -hmm. as a, as a practicing addict. But if it was available, like at a dispensary or if someone was in a methadone clinic and they knew that they were using as well, um, that that could be an option. Like a familiar environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question came in. A number of people who are addicted are addicted are labeled as FASD or developmentally disabilities. Um, are the detox programs programs available that are not based solely on cognition? I think so. Aren't they, Carl? Yeah. Yeah, I they, can, so. they can pretty much deal with anyone yeah. coming into detox on an individual basis. Or there's actually day talks too, where people can go and learn about detox and about how uh, recovery works or how your body feels and what your head's doing during it when if you're trying to come off of drugs. So if someone's developmentally delayed or um, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, you know, I don't know what their capacity would be because that's the important part. Um, if their capacity is enough that they can understand the difference between, you know, I'm using, I'm not using, then that's, that's something to work with. But it all depends, I guess, on the individual. Do we have a day talks in Burnaby? No, it's out in Surrey. No. At, uh, <laughs> at uh, Creekside, above Creekside, but not like I said, yeah. Burnaby has really fallen uh, quite a bit behind with the services, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I'm really trying to advocate for is more services in Burnaby, so Burnaby can lead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, it's much needed. The both of you spoke about trauma and contributing to your health and conditions. Um, how do we reduce the stigma so that trauma becomes something that doesn't need to be hidden and could be treated? Um, yeah, that's um, that's an interesting question because um, we're so used to, um, in general, uh, vulnerability is weakness. Um, and, um, you know, I myself have uh, experienced others, like they're tuned me out, right? Because it's too weird to talk about or listen. And, and, and also the uh, aspect of, uh, well, you must be weak if you're 
want to talk about that. Um, but I think that's changing over time too, right? Uh, when I was younger, it was, yeah, it's like it not heard of um, unless you're in particular environments like counseling and that. But um, yeah, I think uh, today, which is kind of cool, self-help, self-betterment um, is, um, you know, almost mainstream. Yeah, and I, I was thinking of maybe like some sort of an educational component to trauma, like maybe have um, people go to schools and talk to kids. Like, I think um, like maybe grade seven or eight, maybe even high school, but not younger, because I don't know if they'd really um, be able to you know, come forward enough at that age. So maybe like grade seven, eight or high school and talk about how, what different types of trauma occur. And if this happens, where do you go for help? And who do you talk to if you're experiencing this and who's safe to talk to about this? So they're not bringing it back to the parents or whatever, because the people that are going through the trauma need someone that they can talk to about it. And I don't think a lot of people are doing that right now. I think a lot of the like um, physical abuse or uh, mental abuse that's happening in the home, the kids are not coming to school and going to the guidance counselor. They might, but I think the majority of them are just bottling it up. And it's probably a good idea to bring kind of a trauma uh, awareness, uh, maybe, especially with the last year we've been going through. Oh my God, we've all been through yeah. trauma this last year, just yeah. going through this COVID stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, like I shared with you all that um, when I was younger, I didn't quite understand what that was all about abuse or even trauma. And uh, even when I first came to Charlford, that's what we're working with, right? Self, self itself and the abuse and everything that we've gone through um, as addicts or, or even periods of sober time um, is that trauma can be, yeah, just like you said, right? The COVID issue, because I always thought trauma was like something huge and something big and profound. And I didn't realize the subtleties of trauma or even abuse and, and I think uh, stuff like this should be taught in school, like a generalization, something, right? Something's, you know, because not all parents That's know. Maybe not just about parent. fear, right? That's yeah. not just about fear, yeah. 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 Right? They, if you're from a different ethnic background, that changes things in their way that they deal with things, do you mm -hmm. think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So it would... It would be nice if there would be supports in different ethnic communities, like community supports, and that would be nice to address trauma in that community. Yeah, because a lot of uh, people in um, different communities have very tight knit families that don't want to talk about what's happening in that family because uh, they think it's some sort of shame or um, embarrassment to the family. But um, trying to be as healthy as we can, we need to discuss things. So, yeah. Yeah. Communicate. Um, like maybe uh, have some kind of an advocate in uh, certain ethnic uh, community centers or their churches. Um you know, somewhere somebody could feel safe to come to um, share what's going on and know that it's it's okay to talk about it. It's, 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 it's essential. It's actually very essential for us as human beings to share that stuff. We only have time for a couple uh, questions, and I don't want to cut either of you off. I really appreciate um, you sharing today. Um, but uh, maybe the second to last question, it just came into the chat and I think it's an important question to ask. Uh, how important was stable housing um, in your in your recovery? Huge, huge, <laughs> it's huge. You know, um, I, I've never been homeless, 
uh, or on living on on the street. Um, I've always had somewhere to go. That was my safe place. So I had to have housing, and um, I, I can't imagine what people go through and how the hell are they supposed to get their life together when they don't even have a roof over their head, um, somewhere to go to call home. You know, uh, have a place to. Uh, yeah, just have a place I can't even imagine. I, yeah, I it was. It was those like, oh my god. Yeah, it was super important to me because mm-hmm. when you're building uh, your recovery, you need like um, a solid foundation to start. And if you don't have housing, that's like the main one of the main pillars of that yeah. foundation is oh. housing, um, and then you build on that. But the housing, if you don't have a place like that offers uh, counseling and and group sessions and one on one and stuff like that, then like good luck (laughs) if it's just a house by itself. Yeah, I think that takes a lot of stress to off people knowing you have a home to go to uh, a warm place. You don't have to be on survival mode and uh and then, yeah, like you said, it is a huge part of the foundation of um, carrying on with a healthy lifestyle and start yeah. healing. Huge. Yeah. Um, so as we wrap up, maybe just my final question would be, uh, what do you want people to know? Like, what do you, what do you want them to know about you if we're here to challenge stigma um, mm. and, you know, change, change the kind of cycle of shame what do you want people to know Mm, maybe that addicts are human Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh that uh we have um feelings like anyone else and just because their people are using or abusing their themselves they uh, still require care that nurturing, uh, just being seen and heard um, is huge. Uh, un- unfortunately, some people um, have to take, uh, up, go down a path that they don't want to go down and um, it accumulates. Um, housing being one of them, right? Housing being one of them. You know, I know I've known a lot of people um, that have had to go to the streets and then you kind of, you become a product of your environment, sad to say. And um, generally that's what happens too. And, um, you know, my main objective is to let people know, um, yeah, that I'm suffering. I'm suffering um, spiritually and that, yeah, I need help just like any other human being. I do have feelings. Um I want to love and to be loved, you know, is oh, everybody's goal. Um, and if you could just look past the exterior, you know, just look past the exterior and think of um, that person as being somebody's father, somebody's son, uncle, you know, maybe even grandfather, or same with, you know, female grandma, she's a mother. You know, things go wrong in people's lives. And um, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes uh, bad things happen and you get stuck. Oh, they all need help and nurturing. Well, thank you very much. Both of you uh, have been shown a lot of courage and I know that uh, you're getting a lot of thank yous and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really amazing for you to share today. Um, just wanted to also uh, let folks know that in two weeks we have another session with two other peers are going to come and talk uh, to us, which is really exciting. Um, so thank you again to Dilpreet and Carl and Haiti so much. And thanks for everyone that came. Um, here's a few links. And we will be um, emailing you the recording and, and the questions and answers uh, as participants. And so thanks thank for everybody. hosting us. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you, ladies. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank, thank you for you. the questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day.